The swarming robots are, it, it's quite mesmerizing. It's a little bit like you know, when you stand on the beach and you watch the waves or you stand and watch a fire burning and it's kind of, the movement mesmerizes you. They're building a business where they're effectively permanently reinvesting everything they have. When we get to 80, we don't start to plan the celebration party for when we hit 100, we move the target. Grocery, it's a multi-trillion dollar market. If they get a small slice of that, that will be hugely meaningful. We can't see anyone anywhere in the world that has anything close to the suite of solutions and products that we have. Hello and welcome to Invest in Progress, a podcast brought to you by the Scottish Mortgage Team. I'm Claire Shaw, a Director and Investment Specialist. This podcast is designed to give you a behind the scenes look at the conversations that take place between our managers and the visionary founders, entrepreneurs and business leaders of some of the world's most exceptional growth companies. As we are a UK investment trust, we can only market Scottish mortgage to certain audiences and in certain jurisdictions. Check out the podcast description to ensure this content is suitable for you. Also, please bear in mind that as with any investment, your capital is at risk. Today, our guest is one of the original founders of Ocado, Tim Steiner. Ocado has frequently been characterised as rather upmarket, given in the minds of the UK consumer, it is synonymous with grocery retailers, Waitrose and Marks and Spencers. But it's so much more than just an online retailer. This is one of the most exciting and innovative companies that we have in the portfolio, a company which has artificial intelligence and robotics at its core. Joining me to discuss this opportunity is Lawrence Burns. Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you for having me. So, Lawrence, it's safe to say that Ocado is a name that's going to be familiar to most of our listeners. But from our perspective, we think it's probably one of the most misunderstood companies we have in the portfolio. Why is this? So, I think a lot of people listening are probably quite familiar with Ocado. They'll have seen the vans go through their neighbourhood. They'll hopefully have ordered a few times from it. But I think what's interesting about Ocado is that although it started as that online grocery supermarket, it's evolved to be a lot more than that. They've taken the technology, the robotics, the AI, the software that goes into delivering those grocery orders at world-leading economics, and they've started building what they call the Ocado Smart Platform to make that available to other grocers around the world that are having to deal with how do I profitably deliver online groceries. And so for us... The Ocado that the shareholders of Scottish Mortgage see in everyday life is only really a fraction of the overall value of the business that we're looking at. The Ocado that we're looking at is one that is about technology and is global in its both its current footprint, but also its continuing aspirations. And when you think about the fact that groceries are, I think, an eight trillion pound market, you know, Ocado, as you say, is a company whose opportunity is both large and global. So We've got Tim Steiner coming on. We're going to be talking to him shortly. But in your opinion, what is it about Tim Steiner's vision that you think him and Ocado are well-placed to capitalise on this opportunity? So in terms of Ocado being well-placed, I mean, it's it's good to remember they've, they've been at this for 22 years now. That is a long time of trying to build this up, a lot of experience accumulated. And I think what they've been able to do is effectively pool the resources of their 12 grocery partners. And that gives them a scale that is quite hard to be matched um, by other companies wanting to start and go into this. But in, in terms of sort of why Tim specifically, which I think is an interesting question, I think people listening are about to get a good sense of why Tim specifically, because whenever I've talked to him, he is someone that is... He has a very large-scale vision, as you said, but he also, you know, his background is that of an investment banker, but you'll think you're talking to an engineer, I think, in terms of, you know, those robotic hives that deliver and sort those groceries. He's got one of those in his head whenever you talk to him. You know, he knows every single process that's going on with those structures. And I think having a CEO that has a vision but is able to combine that with having a really bottom-up understanding of the actual technological product they're building is, is hard to do and valuable. Obviously, Lawrence, you and I will catch up afterwards, but everything I've read about Tim, everything I've read about Ocado, I'm very excited to listen actually to this. So with that, I will hand over to you and Tim. Firstly, I think just to start off and just say, yeah, thank you for doing this, but also thank you for the, the generous time you've you've given Scottish Mortgage over the years talking to us. We, we really appreciate it. No, we, we, we appreciate your support of the business. So uh, mutual fan club here. 
I think that the starting point that we where we begin with most of our guests is really just to ask, you know, what is the problem that Ocado are trying to solve? Sure. Look, I, I think we look at this a couple of different ways. From a consumer perspective, going to the supermarket and doing your shopping was viewed by consumers to be their second least favorite chore of the week after doing the ironing. You have to constantly replenish groceries once or twice a week at least. And it's not a fun experience. Some people say, oh, I like going to the supermarket, but they're normally people who go twice a year, not are forced to go to feed their families. And so there's the enjoyment side of it, where we think it's a chore uh, that can be turned into something much better. And then there's the economic side of it, where we say that any means of distribution of grocery uses a combination of property and capital, people, energy, and food waste. Now, some means use more of one and less of the other, but we believe through the application of, you know, advanced technologies, whether that's, you know, AI, machine learning code and stuff like that, or whether that's robotics and other forms of automation, that we can actually reduce the costs and therefore reduce the, ultimately reduce the cost of groceries. We're not there quite yet, but reduce the cost of groceries for consumers. And in doing that, you know, groceries is a large, you know, it's 50% of retail spend in developed markets. It's obviously all of retail spend in undeveloped markets, and we can improve people's lives. That's fantastic. And I have to say, I'm not one of those people that appreciates or enjoys spending my weekend going around a windowless warehouse for two hours. So you can definitely see the appeal. You co-founded Ocado in 2000 with two friends and, and prior to that were at Goldman Sachs, which would have been obviously a, a very sort of well-paid and, and successful job. I mean, thousands of people every year tried to get into Goldman Sachs. Where did the idea for Ocado came from? And what was it that inspired you to leave that world of investment banking behind? Sure. Look, I think that in 99 in particular, it was quite heady days in terms of, you know, looking at people starting these businesses, some of which have turned out to be amazing businesses and a lot of which turned out to be completely hopeless businesses. But there was a lot of excitement. There was a lot of energy. Uh, there was a lot of backing. And there was a view that the internet could obviously, you know, dramatically change our lives, probably didn't realize quite how dramatically and probably it ended up changing it in many different ways to the ways that were envisaged back then. But Whilst it was a great career at Goldman Sachs, and I think it's a great firm, and I was making a lot of money, I had come from uh, more of an entrepreneurial background. So both my parents, and my grandparents, all had started or run businesses, not at the scale of an Ocado, but had, had nevertheless kind of come from that business background. And the kind of combination of wanting to do something more meaningful than moving bonds around and, and earning a lot of money combined with the background that I'd come from, combined with the heady times, and it just felt the time to go out and try and do something, you know, more interesting, more meaningful, more impactful, obviously more personal risk, but something I felt comfortable taking at that point in my life. Yeah, it must give a very entrepreneurial background and sort of the encouragement of what, what's possible. And I suppose sticking with those early days, which is curious, yeah, where the name of Avocado came from, I and mean, presumably there's a, a linkage to Avocado yeah, I mean, uh, kind of embarrassingly, because when I meet a number of great entrepreneurs these days, they all kind of claim to say that they just got out of Thesaurus and kind of chose their own names. But we in those days thought we needed to be kind of professional. And so we actually work with Interbrand. Uh, we obviously didn't pay the money that huge conglomerates pay sometimes to rebrand themselves today, but we did nevertheless probably pay a six-figure, a low six-figure sum to come up with the name and the branding. And they went away and came back with a number of ideas or suggestions, some of which are wholly inappropriate. And I can't even say on this podcast because I would get cancelled. And yet they actually came and kind of pitched those to us. And Ocado was one of them. And yes, it was, it was well, some of the brief that we'd given them was we wanted a short name because on the internet, Sainsbury's is a lot further away than Asda is, right, in terms of having to type it, right? We wanted a name that didn't mean something awful in another language if we ended up either just, you know, multinational country that we live in, or if we ever went overseas with it. So, you know, we were familiar with Vauxhall selling the Nova across uh, Europe and obviously meaning, you know, doesn't go in, in some languages. So there was that kind of brief, non-descriptive, because if you were, whilst the car phone warehouse was very successful for many years, you know, somebody else can then say, we're Tim's the best car phone warehouse there is because it's too descriptive. So non-descriptive, short, not offensive in another language and kind of come up with something. And they came up with a cardo and yes, they had a nice story around how 
the skin protects the, the wonderful contents inside the avocado. And we also want to be able to buy it and buy the misspellings. So, you know, if you spell it O-C-A-R-D-O by mistake or A-K-A-D-O, they all get come to us. There weren't other businesses that use those names already. And so it kind of, it, it worked. And the, the strange thing was one of the things they did to show you is they showed you kind of branding on a vehicle and branding on a website, but they also kind of wrote an article they pretended was in the FT. And we kind of looked at that and went kind of ha ha. And then you didn't realize how many times you were actually going to see the word Ocado in the FT. Um, but I always think with brand, people always go, oh, you've got the most fabulous brand. And I always say in cars, you know, if, if Enzo Ferrari had actually been called Enzo Skoda, I just think they would have been the other way around. You know, we would, we would have all kind of dreamt of one day being able to buy a Skoda, not one day being able to buy a Ferrari. The brand, I think, is really the kind of totality of people's view of what it is that you do, what, what your product is, what your service is, what your proposition is. People often think it's the other way around, that you start with a great name and that's what creates the great company. And I think it's completely the opposite way around. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's an output of the customer's experience, the brand, rather than what you decide to call it. And at least by outsourcing the naming, you could focus on, on making sure the customer experience in the long run was going to be good. I, I, I did I did several years later meet somebody who was on the team who claimed that they had kind of gone away, done nothing for several weeks. And then the day before they were due to come and see us, they'd kind of, I think, maybe played with a few illegal substances, uh, laid on the floor and then come up with a few ideas that they then pitched to us. But uh, whether there's any truth in that, whether they would be amusing, I'm not sure. <laughs> Creativity has to come from somewhere. Yes. And, and, you know, obviously we got to know Ocado when it was a public company, but you spent 10 years as a, as a private company. And actually, I don't know that much about that period before you were listed. And just be interesting, you know, what were some of the challenging moments in that 10 years of, of building it up privately? And also, what were the key milestones that made you go, actually, I think this is really going to work? So I would say it was an extremely challenging 10 years in that what people... I think fail to understand is people think execution is easy and they think it's all about, you know, oh, you just have to have the idea, you're right place at the right time. And, you know, a number of people have the, you know, are in the right place at the right time, but they just fail on the execution. And so we spent a large part of that 10 years trying to satisfy the customer demand that we were quite easily generating at that point. So it was kind of designing our first warehouse, designing the software, getting it put together and, and kind of functioning was immensely complex. Uh, not losing all our money to unscrupulous software companies that were quite happy to take it, claiming they were going to deliver something that works and delivering things that didn't work or worked fit for purpose. And then kind of getting the, a warehouse live and realizing that it didn't do what it was supposed to do. And I went from somebody who had, you know, a originally an economics kind of accounting mathematical type background to learning about and understanding flow and conveyors and the kind of the decision tree that you want to use to make them work and actually very quickly becoming more expert at that than the companies that sell that equipment across Europe. And so then starting to either rewrite the software, although I don't write software, but asking software people to rewrite the software to make decisions based on different things, different attributes or different locations or different barcode readers and the, where you put them and when you make a decision and what you do because what they did is they were creating traffic systems effectively, and they weren't very good at it. And so we literally struggled to grow. So it was really about kind of breaking through volume. You know, well, we've done 2,000 orders. We want to do 3,000 orders. We want to do 5,000 orders a week. We wanted to get to 10,000 orders a week. And I kind of got bored of either third parties that we work with or people internally that have come out of industry trying to fix it. And I went, okay, I'm taking the laptop home and I'm going to write an entirely new way of doing it. And I'm going to take the risk. And we went from like 6,000 to 10,000 orders in about three weeks. And at the same time, I, I had a challenge from some very senior executives that worked for us who'd gone to our partners at John Lewis, tried to suggest to remove us from the company. And so when I found out, my colleagues found out, they were like, oh, we've got to remove them from the company. And I said, no, no one's going anywhere till we hit 10,000 orders because I don't want anyone to look like, you know, I want to solve the problem and then I can work out who I want to work with. But I've got to solve the problem, prove that I can solve the problem first. And I think we, you know, we went from that famous 10,000 orders a week. And I think, um, you know, we were up in the high hundred and something thousand by the time we went public. And was it difficult doing that both in some ways in the aftermath of the dot com bubble, but also specifically, you talk about raising money. I wonder how much of an impediment people thinking back to Webvan, for example, was, which is one of the big delivery companies for online food that didn't work out in quite a big way. 
Yeah, Webvan was unfortunately one of the most spectacular bankruptcies post the dot-com boom that was deemed to kind of have got through about a billion two or something like that of cash, which in those days was one of the biggest numbers. And they'd reached a valuation of something like $9 billion uh, when they were doing like $80 million of sales or something. So they were like over 100 times sales in valuation and they failed very spectacularly. Uh, there were some quite good lessons there. And I went out there actually twice, once while it was failing and once after it had failed just to kind of see and learn a bit from it. But yes, it, yeah, for a number of years, there are a lot of people who believe this could never work because of WebVan. Now that was a two-edged sword for us because on the one hand, it came up time and time again when we were trying to raise money. And some people who would initially listen to us and get very excited and then they would kind of go away and then they go, oh, someone's just explained to us this whole WebVan thing and how it never works and therefore we can't do it. So that we had that problem a number of times. The flip side of that is... Uh, the entire U.S. market got educated into the perspective that this was well tried by Webvan and therefore impossible. And I would say that we were experimenting and learning how to do this in this field for a material amount of time, while no one in the U.S. that's normally the kind of at the forefront of innovation. And I think, you know, in your own funds, you're, you have very few companies outside of the US that you're investing in or, out, or certainly so very few in the UK, uh, because we're not normally the hotbed of innovation. Normally somebody's done this in California successfully first, and that, that isn't the case in what we do. And I think one of the things that's given us this kind of 20 plus year advantage is that WebVan blew up so spectacularly and persuaded everybody to stay out of this space. For a lot of people in the UK, because they shop and they use Ocado retail, the online supermarket, I always feel sometimes that, that casts a bit of a shadow over the actual understanding of the business and its value and what it's really doing at heart. Because, And I don't know how much you started as saying this is going to be an online supermarket, but today at least the business is about robotics, AI, software, how do I provide a technology platform for grocers all around the world to do something that's really challenging, complex and physical, but to do it with a good economics. And certainly sort of the way we see it is the Ocado supermarket business, it, it's good for validating that technology, but it's a small part of the overall value. Um, so just be curious, was that part of the vision originally? And how is how you define or what you were targeting at Ocado to be changed over time? Yeah, look, it, it, it's hard to answer that question exactly because I can go back to early business plans that talked about developing it and then monetizing the IP that we developed globally. At that point, the IP that we thought we were developing was how to put together third-party software, third-party automation, marketing, retailing skills, and how to mix it all up in a different form of offer, right? As Webvan had tried to do before and failed, over time, we've done the most extraordinary amount of vertical integration. So as you say, today we're definitely a software, you know, into AI, machine learning, robotics company, both the kind of the robots that move on the grids and move the boxes around, but also kind of the multi-axis uh, robots that we're now going to you know, start to deploy to do things like picking tasks and stuff like that. And when other people say, oh, we're a robotics company, that still means they buy those multi-axis robot arms and then they write the vision systems or the gripper technologies or just kind of try and, and write the control systems to use them in a certain environment to do a certain job. We are vertically integrated to the point where we have a subsidiary in Las Vegas uh, that builds multi-axis robot arms using additive manufacturing. So kind of 3D printed carbon fiber, the lightest, most energy efficient, and we believe least expensive for the accuracy and capability robot arms in the world. And the key there is to be able to build one that is customized to its use case that might be very unique to what we want to do and how we want to do it. And everything here is around the scale of the grocery market and therefore the benefit of cost domination in the grocery market, because if you can do it and you can be successful at it, you can deploy it at such enormous scale. And so I, I don't think we had a vision that we were going to be anything like as exciting or as innovative or kind of spread our wings as far as we have done. But we definitely realized at that point in time that if we did do clever things, 
we couldn't and shouldn't, you know, kind of sit on our beautiful little island here and, you know, deploy them in a population of 60 something million on a planet with seven or eight billion people. And is it worth talking a bit about the complexities of the task you're trying to do? Because it's much more complex than a traditional warehouse or a traditional e-commerce warehouse because you've, you've got 40,000 SKUs, you've got people ordering 40 items at a time, you've got three different temperature control zones, you've got an unfavorable value to weight ratio, they're perishable, they're heterogeneous. It'd just be helpful, you know, just taking us through, you, know, you call them CFCs, Custom Fulfillment Centers. What does a CFC look like? Sure. And, and you know, you've, you've thrown out the items that I would have, have mentioned just there. So an average order is about 45 items. That would include an item or two from a freezer that we need to deliver at less than minus 18 degrees C and we store at minus 28 degrees C. It will include about 45% of it coming from a naught to 8 degrees C fridge effectively. And the reason, as you say, that these warehouses are more complex is that if you were in a giant Amazon warehouse that shipped, you know, one and a quarter million items a day, they'll ship them, you know, maybe one, two or three at each parcel. And you can kind of pick in any sequence that you want to. The key to your grocery order is we've got to deliver that 45 item order and we want to hand it over to somebody at the doorstep or bring it into their kitchen for them. And therefore, we need to pick our million and a quarter or so items that we might do in a single warehouse in a day in an incredibly choreographed way where, you know, we've got a five minute window that we want to load, load a customer's order onto a van. And we've got to get their four boxes with an average of 12 items from those three temperature zones at that door in that moment. So the choreography is, is critical. And the next challenge that you mentioned is that whilst groceries have got a margin that is reasonable, you know, it's probably in the middle of the range as a percentage margin in retail, you know, somewhere between 25 and 35 points, depending on where you are, how you include, how you measure, et cetera. The average item price is a fraction of an alternative retailing format. So, you know, in the UK grocery market, anywhere from kind of £1.80 to £3 or something would be different retailers' average item prices. And so the cash margin per item, the cash margin per litre of volume, the cash margin per kilo of weight is extremely low compared to any other retailing type of goods, clothing or sports goods or whatever else it is. And so the amount of margin that you have to play with to store the goods, to handle the goods, and then to consolidate them into these 45 orders of these multiple temperature regimes and then deliver them to the customer's house is the lowest of any industry. But the volume is vast because the cash sales in a market like the UK are approximately the same as the whole of rest of retail put together. And then you have another complexity, which is that, you know, sometimes people in clothing, they say, oh, fashion is very difficult business because we've got three seasons or four seasons that we've got to manage. And the mini skirts that we bought for the summer, you know, we didn't sell them all in the summer and now in the winter, they're not going to sell. Well, uh, you know, come and sell bananas or, 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 or tuna steaks because, you know, we give ourselves 24 hours from the moment a banana arrives in our warehouse, if it's not shipped, it's thrown away. So we have 365 seasons of bananas a year. And so you add it all together. And what you want to do is you want to build a warehouse that can deal in large volume because that gives you economies of scale, particularly on the way in. So you can get direct deliveries from suppliers rather than having to go through distribution centers that add more stages, more handling, more transportation and more costs. You need to be able to move goods around quickly and create and consolidate these orders. And you need to do it all using the minimum amount of labor. And so when we compare what we do in one of our warehouses today to what we would see as a best in class globally of the people who do online grocery, but utilizing a store network, we estimate that they use to our best kind of uh, view about 74 minutes of human labor to receive the goods in their DC, to then pick them in their DC, send them to store, to then put them on the shelf in the store, to then pick them from the shelf, consolidate them and put them in a van. We have that down at around 15 minutes in the warehouses that we've been building in the last uh, kind of four or five years. Any warehouse that's been commissioned in the last, say, six months, by the time that warehouse goes live, we'll have that down at sub 10 minutes. And obviously, at some point, we want to get to, you know, kind of almost negligible human intervention as such. So we've already taken out 
80% of the labor that you would use doing this manually. And we want to get that into the high 90s. So it's about becoming more efficient. And that enables us to reinvest that in the delivery without charging a premium on the groceries, without charging high delivery fees, and in carrying the widest ranges to give the most choice to our customers, because we think choice is important. And we're probably two or three times the amount of grocery choice that any other supermarket has in the UK. And, and I think a, a lot of people would probably be surprised if they saw your most recent facilities and feel like they're almost getting their groceries from something in science fiction in terms of you've got that giant high structure and, and, and bots that you know, no doubt you'd, you'd describe better than me. But also, I think it's just the progress that we've seen over years because your first site was Hatfield. And if you go around that, it's conveyor belts. If you go around your latest site, it's swarming robots. Yeah, and I think that the swarming robots are, it's quite mesmerizing. It's a little bit like you know, when you stand on the beach and you watch the waves or you stand and watch a fire burning and it's kind of the movement mesmerizes you. We, we can have over a thousand robots on a grid and they're moving in the X and Y axis. And if they, you know, if they move parallel to each other, they're less than the, the width of my um, pinky, you know, five millimeters or something like that apart. And when they stop on a, on a space, having been traveling at kind of four meters a second, they have to stop in less than one millimeter's tolerance of where we want them to stop. Because if, if one overshot by two millimeters one way and another one overshot by two millimeters the other way, we could end up with a collision. And just watching how closely they work and they move, and you can't tell what they're doing. That's the funny thing is you just see these robots whizzing around on the top of, as you call it, this hive, which is the metal structure with the kind of boxes and what we call peripherals, the places that we do an activity from the, to those boxes underneath. You could just see them all moving around and there, some of them are grabbing stock from inventory and taking it to a pick station because a customer wants that good. Some of them are then taking those boxes back and storing them. Some of them are moving those customer boxes from that pick station after they've got all their orders there and moving them to store them temporarily and then consolidate them with other customers and then send them out the building. But you can't tell. But when you watch them, it's absolutely fascinating, yes. To get them to do that, we have a proprietary communication system because... Wi-Fi and 4G and anything that was industrial in, in, in the communication space was incapable of the amount of messaging to the amount of independent devices with the frequency that we wanted to do. Nobody was capable of, of delivering to us a system to do that. So we went off and worked with some scientists here in the UK. Uh, we own all the IP and we created this communication system to allow us to communicate with the robots frequently enough to know where they all are 10 times a second. And therefore, if one of them's not where it's supposed to be to make the others react to that and it react to that before you might get a collision. And am I right in saying that that's the most dense communication system that's been developed anywhere in the world that's based on 4G that you've developed in-house? We believe it's the most dense wireless communication system in the world, yes. And all so that we can pick groceries cheaply, enable our clients to pick groceries cheaply so they can deliver an outstanding kind of customer proposition to buy groceries. But that's what you have to do to be able to achieve the end goal. There was someone that um, he's worked at other supermarkets in senior positions in automation. I think he, he worked for you for a number of years who I was reading, you know, recently sort of described what Ocado had built and what other people might be building in the robotic warehouse space and just said they might sometimes look similar, but it's a bit like a Lamborghini might look for, similar to a Ford Focus in terms of some of the technology that you've put in with Ocado obviously being the Lamborghini in this example. So I think it is really easy to underestimate the technological sophistication that are going into getting you a fresh bunch of bananas. And, and as you said, you know, the opportunity is huge. Groceries are a large part of retail globally. And globally, you know, only 5% of groceries are sold online. And I think that number is 15% still in the UK. So I think that shows the scale of the opportunity. But you've already got 12 of the world's largest grocers signed up across four different continents. How powerful do you think the competitive advantage is that you're offering your partners, both the current and the future ones that you might sign? Well, I think it's massive because, again, it's not just these automated warehouses. So what we provide to them is, you know, a, a cloud-based effectively a SaaS system for running their online grocery business. So it extends through the mobile apps, the web, the search engines, the recommendation engines, the 
order management, the uh, supply chain systems, as well as everything in the warehouse, the dispatch stuff and the the in-vehicle navigation and kind of software for, for handling the goods over to the clients and stuff. And because we develop it all, A, it's all focused around this one industry and B, it's incredibly interactive as such. So, you know, if something happens in the warehouse, the instantaneous reaction on the website to not sell it to somebody else is, is streets ahead of trying to build all this stuff out of different systems and create them and integrate them. And people often talk about legacy systems. I think what people should talk about is how legacy. So, you know, I'm running a 20 year old legacy system, but when they then go and replace that by buying software from three or four different vendors with an enormous amount of customization, as well as a lot of configuration in it, the new thing they run the next day is a new legacy system. It's just a legacy system that's only one day old. And the way that we work is that everybody that's using our front end, everybody that's using our supply chain and everybody that's using the warehouse software is running the same software. Everybody's in the same live version and the version is updating. And when we've signed on a new retailer as a client, and if in their market, either because of their customer practice or because of their competition or because of their regulatory environment or whatever it might be, there's something that we don't have that they really want. We build it into the platform. Everybody has the advantage of using it. And so A, everybody's software is just constantly getting new features that they didn't ask for because somebody else did ask for them, which that's very powerful. B, there's something very powerful in these multiple retailers running slightly similar. They're all slightly different, but very similar businesses using this platform because we can provide a lot of comparison data to see how they're performing. So, you know, we've got 19 of these warehouses live at the moment, whereas if you were a retailer in a country and you'd built just one, you know, you wouldn't know whether you're really doing well in it or not because you'd kind of against what benchmark. And so the difference here is we can look and say, oh, look, this warehouse in Perfleet they achieve this in outbound or in inbound or in, you know, in a certain area, we can take into account differences in consumer behavior. Like, oh, in the United States, more of the basket is frozen than it is in the UK. We can adjust for that and say, oh, look, your warehouse is performing only at 70% of this one. And the difference is in this area. And therefore, everybody wants to run one that's in the top quartile. And so we're creating this club and this network between our clients where everybody wants to improve what they're doing to be in the top quartile, which will help all of them to drive up their overall efficiency. So this, the scale of what we're doing also means that it justifies the, the investment that we make. As you know, with tech, it's the biggest cost is in creating the software. And so we can create more reliable software. We can create more higher functionality software because we're deploying this across 12 and hopefully more retailers that are large retailers in large markets and at scale. And therefore we can justify an investment in, in software or robotics that no individual retailer could justify on their own. And that of course is just a virtuous cycle. And, and I suppose the other key point of it as well is that because it's based on robotics, AI and software, it keeps getting better cheaper potentially and better um, or some combination of that. And certainly where We've talked to different technology companies, uh, you know, I won't, won't name them, that have looked at the Ocado software, looked at the platform. They said, well, we looked three years ago and we thought it was interesting. doesn't make sense for the labor economics in our market. But then we looked at it a year ago and it got better. And we're going to look at it again in three years because we're quite confident it'll be better then. And at some point, it's going to make sense in terms of our economics because it keeps improving. How much further do you think you can go in terms of improving that offer? Is there a risk that the improvements at this point plateau or do you still see them sort of low-hanging, not low-hanging fruit, but the ability to improve from here? Look, I think there's two main cost parts of the business. One is in the warehouses and we're doing a phenomenal job as part of Reimagined and, and beyond in saying, how can we get the same volume out of smaller buildings or more volume out of the same size buildings? So how do we make the, the client side building cost per order lower? And we've taken out over 20% of the size of a building. So if you asked us to build a building now versus a year ago to do a certain volume, we would now ask you to find a space that's 20% less. So you've got 20% less rent, presumably rates, your utility bills will be lower. And you know that I don't know how much further we can go, but we'll keep trying to do that. And then there's the how much effort has to go into producing this uh, um, 45 or whatever the size is order. And as I said, that's where we've gone from 74 minutes in the manual version to 15 in the version we have today to just less than 10 in the version we're selling now. Do I believe we'll go to five and below? Yes, we, we will. It's only a matter of, of time and focus and effort. 
So there's a lot of scope there. Then there's the delivery side where we can doing some other clever things that are largely at the moment around improving the customer proposition, more immediacy, more same day, um, the ability to add items at a later date up to an order that's arriving kind of later today or tomorrow or whatever it is. Taking the, the human effort out of that obviously is a much bigger step. So you're then into autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles ought to come to the grocery market for these deliveries before we actually can get in a taxi that hasn't got a driver in it. Two reasons for that. One is that you can speed restrict the vehicle that's delivering your groceries and the groceries aren't getting frustrated. And secondly, the autonomous car dilemma of I have old passenger in the back of the car and I have little kid who runs out with a ball and software says in a matter of milliseconds, one of them's got to die and the software has to decide who is incredibly difficult. It's the big dilemma of the industry. The, the trolley dilemma, I think they call it in philosophy. Is it? Okay. But here it's a really easy one because I'm just going to drive the customer shopping into the wall and kill it. Right. And, and little Johnny can safely get his ball and go back to the sidewalk kind of thing. You know, that would be a very big step in the cost structure of groceries delivered to your home. I think it will come, but I don't know when. It's not as the automation of the warehouses is a bit more of a linear kind of, we can keep making improvements. The delivery side is a bigger leap to get to the first step. And obviously the, the key of having so many options of the things you could go in. It's, it's an output of what you've built, what you've created, and what the innovative culture of Ocado has created. How have you been able to sort of maintain that innovative culture as you grow? Because it's, it's one of the things that's always struck me. You know, I remember seven years ago going to an Ocado event for suppliers, and you had Paul Clark, your CTO, sort of talking about the tsunamis of technology that would change the landscape, big data, IoT, AI. So you've been working on a lot of things that have become buzzwords before they were sort of the buzzwords. But how have you been able to foster that that sort of culture and, 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 and continually improving ability? Look, I think it's a few things. The first one is, you know, we, we love innovation and we are never satisfied. So we set ourselves a goal to get to 100 and we are at 20. When we get to 80, we don't start to plan the celebration party for when we hit 100. We move the target. And as we've learned what it takes to get there, we've probably got a few ideas that take us to 120. So let's set a target to go to 120 or 140 or 160. We've also got ourselves much more comfortable, I think, than most corporates do in terms of risk-taking. We're very supportive of our teams experimenting. And sometimes we acknowledge that they won't always succeed and that they will sometimes fail, but that we'll just keep trying and we'll, we'll move on. And so I think we're good at that. I think we've been good at deciding where to place specs. So there aren't a lot of things that we spent money on and we did succeed, but actually the thing was useless. And so I, I, I don't know, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it is a culture and it is something that we've built up over a number of years. And it's something that we work very hard on, on maintaining. What are the sort of lessons or things that you've found out along the way of the sort of 20-year journey that as you look back, you go, well, is there a key thing that you wish you'd known at the outset that would have helped you? You know, Lawrence, I think if we'd been much smarter at the outset and we'd realized how complex and difficult this was, we probably wouldn't have started it. People often say, what was the skill that enabled you to start your business? And I sound to say naivety. Uh, but at the same time, I guess persistence and kind of thick skinned and a never give up type attitude is what's enabled us to then take that very difficult reality and continue trying to create a, a great business to come out the other side. I mean, I, you know, we've learned so many lessons along the way. It would be hard to say there's kind of one lesson. We learned that it, what was available in the software industry was far more limited than we expected and didn't suit grocery. That was something we didn't expect when we went into it. So grocery is very, very high volume, very transactional. And a lot of the stuff that had been built to do e-commerce was really focused around non-grocery. And when you try to put grocery volumes through it, it just didn't work. And so we realized that we needed to create our own. If I look back at most of the decisions we've made, most of them are good decisions. Just sometimes wish we'd made them a bit quicker. You know, the, the, the key stuff is we always want, you know, we never want to be arrogant. We never want to be complacent. We always need to believe that we can do better. And we never want to believe that we only want to do better than the next person. We actually want to do the best that's possible. We're not kind of judging ourselves. If someone else is at 100, we're at 110, we're fine. We're trying to get to 1,000. And as you say, 
each CFC you, you set up, it requires upfront capital. It will pay out cash eventually and a, at a very different financial, much better financial profile than what you'd get from a physical supermarket. But that that takes time. But as, as we think out to the future, you said earlier, you've got 19 CFCs that are live today, those um, fulfillment warehouse centers. You've got 64 committed worldwide. How do you think about how big that could be in the very long term? It, it, you know, if we were coming back and doing another podcast in, in 10 years from now. I mean, if we get this right, which is absolutely what we're trying to do, then, you know, the number should be hundreds because I think the average of the ones that we've either built already or clients have committed to doing with us, they are kind of 400, 500 million pounds of capacity, run rate capacity. The global grocery market is trillions of dollars. It's a hundred and 90 something billion pounds just in the UK. So when you say, well, okay, but what if 20% of it goes online? And why would we actually believe that only 20% ultimately goes online? Because ultimately, if online is the cheapest way of distributing groceries, then kind of three quarters of it that's in the developed and developing world. And now you're talking about a couple of trillion. And then if people using our platform took a quarter market share, you'd be talking about half a trillion. And, and so you're talking about a thousand sheds then. Now, is that what we're trying to do? Or are we trying to get the 64 done and maybe double it to 128? That's the big question, if you see what I mean. And that kind of informs some of the investment decisions around if I'm trying to automate a process and I can automate it at what capital cost or at what operating cost, where am I trying to get to? Because if I can get over a tipping point that makes this the method that uses the least property and capital, the least people, the least energy and the least food waste, then this should become the majority distribution as opposed to something that is a niche for people who are happy to pay a delivery fee and don't want to go to a supermarket. And that, that in itself is an interesting opportunity globally, but can we take it to the next level where actually it's a cheaper way of distributing groceries than a hypermarket? And that's really what we want to achieve, but we want to make sure that if we don't quite get there. We, we think we, we will get there and we are getting there. But if it is a 10 or 20% uh, a market share globally, that that still becomes a very big and successful business. Final question we ask is just, you know, what does the world look like if Ocado succeeds? Well, I'd like to think that Ocado could succeed in helping this industry to be better. What does better look like? Better looks like more productive and I think if you know, if you think about the labor challenges in the developed markets today, it's quite clear that it needs to become more productive over time. People want to do uh, different things with their time. And so we need to become more productive. It looks like better service, better choice, better range, better freshness, better usability, you know, just basically easier, less time invested by the end customers themselves, delivering them healthier, fresher, more choice, et cetera. It looks like something that is better for the environment that, you know, uses less buildings, less energy, less CO2, you know, less plastics, et cetera. And so if we can help the global industry to use less property and capital, to use less space, to use less environmental impact, to use less people and to generate less food waste, both us as the retailer, we have the low, uh, Ocado UK has the lowest food waste in the global uh, food industry as a percentage of sales. But if we can help the global industry to save food and we can help our clients' customers to lower their own food waste through some of the innovative things we do in terms of guaranteeing life into the customer's fridge and showing their receipts ordered by life and stuff like that, then we can help the industry to become much, much, much more efficient. It's an industry that's measured in the trillions and it's an industry that spends probably about a third of its sales on handling and distributing its product. And so there, there are hundreds of billions of dollars a year of efficiencies that could come out to benefit consumers and communities. And um, we can't see anyone anywhere in the world that has had the experience, has done the amount of experimentation, or has anything close to the suite of solutions and products that we have that can help someone in our industry to be a, a world leader. Great. Well, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm conscious as ever of your time, Tim, but it's been really great. And 
I think one of the things that always inspires me to do after we've been talking is to sort of go onto YouTube and look up the videos of those hives to see those robots and the sort of just to sort of remind yourself sort of you know, how advanced this is and how far it's come. But really, really appreciate your time. Thanks very much for inviting me. And at the bottom of the episode description, we have a link to the Ocado Customer Fulfillment Center where you can see one of the latest videos of the robotic hive in action. So, Lawrence, I think at the end of series one of this podcast, if we have an award for best use of analogies, I think Tim Steiner might win it with uh, comparing miniskirts to bananas. He's definitely a, a visual thinker in, in how he communicates, it's safe to say. Yeah, you, you would have thought more engineer than Goldman Sachs bond trader. <laughs> but I think in some ways that probably links to what he was saying about it being an incredibly hard project that you know, he's been the founder and CEO of and the need to vertically integrate. And because they're doing something that no one else is really doing, they've had to sort of, you know, how do you make these bots move? How do you make them move around? How do you build the structure that they sort of travel along? And so obviously I've said some of that's innate, but he's been building a very, very physical project over these years. And I think as I said at the beginning, whenever I talk to him, it it's like he's got the hive in his head. And, and when we do investment meetings with him, I'm, I'm sort of desperately trying to scribble down what he's saying because he's taking you step by step how it actually works at each bit with really dense knowledge, some of which I think our audience probably got a flavour of. I know, and he, he used this phrase that the choreography, he, he articulated so elegantly in, in terms of all the different components working in, in sync together. And when we're thinking about the opportunity, you know, I think it was incredibly apparent just the technological edge that Ocado have. But there's also another sort of, I guess, competitive advantage that came through um, for me in the podcast, which by having all these international partners, they're essentially pulling the R&D budgets off some of the biggest grocery companies in, in the world. And that's enabling this sort of scale of investment that few others can match. How do you think about that kind of competitive advantage in terms of just how far ahead they are of, of the competition? So I think it is quite strong and, and there's a the scale aspect of those 12 players. And I think there's also what Tim rightly mentioned of, we're also learning from our 12 partners and what they're encountering. And so you're learning on steroids effectively versus anyone doing this on their own. I think that scale and the, those sort of accumulated learnings, you know, it gives them the ability not just to have a bit of clear water versus anyone else, but also to be moving faster than others can move. And that's, I think, both really interesting and really important. I think we shouldn't, much as Tim was saying, ever be completely complacent. You know, this is also a technology business. You have the ability for things to come out of left field of new and different ways of doing this. And I think, you know, they have some of their own challenges as well in terms of if people want to have smaller order sizes. So it's not just that big weekly shop. It's, well, I want five or 10 items sort of on the Tuesday evening and then another 10, 15 items on the first day, that, that sort of hurts the economics because big baskets for the automation is, is what sort of works best. And so I think there's that permanent need to adapt. And what you'll probably see within grocery is you'll see a range of different use cases. So we invest in Scottish Mortgage in Neuro, for example, so autonomous delivery. So you might have those kind of coming around and, and doing some of the work of the immediacy. Obviously, Ocado would say that they're working on their own immediacy offering, but you don't have to do everything. And I think it goes back to groceries. It's a multi-trillion dollar market. If they get a small, relatively small slice of that, that will be hugely meaningful. But we shouldn't assume that there's only one model that works. And I think Ocado, again, they know that they're coming out with their Zoom facilities, their smaller facilities to sort of address immediacy as well. And then thinking about the competition, maybe from a slightly different angle, Lawrence, I mean, what I was sort of thinking about during the podcast was, is the competition more indirect for Ocado. And what I mean by that is the meal kit delivery companies um, that we have now, you know, restaurant deliveries are getting faster and cheaper. These kind of alternative models of food consumption, which are, I guess, competing for you and I food spend, are they reducing the weekly grocery basket size? Does that affect Ocado? Is that where the real sort of competition lies for Ocado? Yes. So, a lot of what you mentioned also, ironically, we're invested in Scottish Mortgage. So Delivery Hero in terms of if you want restaurant food delivered and, and the more that that happens, the less you're going to be spending on groceries. That's totally correct. If you're ordering meal kits with HelloFresh, then you're either not using or using less um, Ocado or Morrisons. So those are both challenges to what that total TAM is. 
But I'd just probably make a couple of points, and it's, it's the ones we've sort of fought through in our research process we've gone about this. The first is to make sure we see the wood through the trees. This is a multi-trillion dollar market. Grocery is a huge retail category. There is enough room there for all of those companies to be successful. And you know, give the context, we're at 5% global online grocery penetration. We're at 15 in the UK, as, as Tim was quite rightly saying, you know, why shouldn't that be 50? Why shouldn't that be 70%? Who's going to go, well, I desperately want to go around a, a shop and spend my time picking out my own groceries, particularly if they can do that fresher. So I think one is just the sheer scale of the market. But again, I think it sort of matters for the economics and it does make it more challenging if people have smaller basket sizes. How do you deal with that? I think if you're an Ocado, well, you're also not standing still. Your technology is permanently improving. And so I think that helps offset some of those economic benefits. And yet, Maybe you could sort of do something where you encourage people's habits of saying, well, we'll offer you a small discount if you're, or a better delivery time if you're willing to sort of do a larger order. So I think there's lots of different dynamics you can do. It's something that we know we need to monitor in the long run. It's not something that really keeps us up tonight. Yeah. And then, Lawrence, just a final question for me. I mean, I know you've covered Ocado for a long time. You've known Tim for a long time. You've probably written countless research notes on Ocado. So the question I have for you is, did you know that Ocado was named after an avocado? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the straightforward. I had a suspicion, given that, <laughs> but, but um, I certainly didn't know the background that Tim very <laughs> candidly gave of, of them coming up with that. Um, so, so, so that that was that was a new one. I was tempted to ask whether there are other fruits or vegetables or legumes in the running, but <laughs> I think we've got a good story behind that one. A huge thank you to our guests today, Tim Steiner from Ocado, as well as to our investment manager, Lawrence Burns. In the next episode, we will be talking to Chris Gibson, who's the co-founder and CEO of Recursion Pharmaceuticals, a company using machine learning to revolutionize the pharma industry by developing a faster, cheaper, and more successful approach to drug discovery. You can subscribe to our podcast to be kept informed of what is coming up. And you can learn more about Scottish Mortgage by visiting our website, scottishmortgage.com. You've been listening to Invest in Progress. Thank you very much for joining us.